Welcome to the C Word, the Conservatives podcast. Today we're talking about IPM. I'm Jenna Mathiasen, an objects conservative based in South Yorkshire. And I'm Chloe Rumsey, an objects conservative based in Greater Manchester. Welcome to the show, everyone. And t- Hello. today we've got a special guest host. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Jane Thompson Webb. Um, my fancy job title is conservation team leader for Birmingham Museums Trust, but my actual day job is preventive conservator. Oh, very fancy. Hi. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure. It's lovely to be here. Yes, so today we are talking about IPM, and for those who do not know what that is, that is Integrated Pest Management. Beasties, basically. Creepy crawlies. Beautiful beasties and where to where to, where to get rid of them. No, uh, where to find them? <laughs> <laughs> something like that. I, I had a clever name for this episode, um, but I'm pretty sure it's something like that. But yes, so we were always going to do a pest management episode anyway. Mm, it's been on the list for a while, hasn't it? And then with the unfortunate passing of Bob Child, we just thought now was kind of a... Yeah. Now's the time. We should talk about pests. Definitely. Yeah, so like a, a little shout out to Bob, uh, who was an, uh, a well-known household name in the IPM community, mm. is perhaps how mm. we can, can say that. Um, he talked me through a crisis once on the phone. He was very understanding. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, bless <laughs> So yeah, I've only ever like Aww. I've only had one dealing with Bob. Bless him. Uh, he he passed away in December. It was basically just him talking me off a ledge as I found I had a pest infestation and I just did not know what to do. And please help me. I thought I'd just go around the room and kind of go, so what are our dealings with beasties and IPM in general? Maybe, maybe start with Jane, because Jane, you have a you have a long history of this. Yes, amazingly. Um, I don't really know where the time has gone. but um, So I lead the IPM programme for Birmingham Museums Trust. We're a nine-site organisation. One of the sites I don't particularly bother about because it's a ruined medieval manor house and the various oh, birds and rats and mice and things that live <laughs> there I just let them get on with it but um, (laughs) self-sufficient but we look at the pests in in all our other properties and then the previous job that I had which I kind of still do for Birmingham Museums Trust when I was merely a humble preventive conservator before I also became team leader was funded through Renaissance in the Regions funding which people in the UK might remember it was a, a government funding stream that came online in 2003 And we ran a training programme for museums across the West Midlands. And that enabled me to meet and get to know the wonderful David Pinniger. Mm. Um, And he initially ran our IPM courses and then it became a double hander. And now I do the initial uh, IPM ones. Dave can still occasionally be persuaded to do Insect ID. And through working with Dave, I've had an opportunity to do all sorts of exciting things. So I've worked with him on the professional conservators in practice practice course at West Dean College. Um, I've taught with him in Lisbon and in Malta. I now teach the slots for the National Trust Environment and Housekeeping course and also on the new uh, Collections Care and Conservation Management course, which is also run at West Dean. And Dave and I also put together a website, um, which I suspect we may mention a little bit more later on. Pests have kind of become my thing. I never really intended that they they would. (laughs) Ironically, it was Bob Child who first taught me about pests because he came and did that bit when I was a student at Cardiff University. (laughs) Uh, And then it was in abeyance for quite some time until I became a a preventive conservator. Yeah, and they're my absolute, absolute favourite thing. It's um, I, I have a good day when I come into the office and find that someone has left a pest trap on my desk for me to have a look. an absolute bonus (laughs) I'm glad you feel that way because I think it's a bit of a mixed bag once people leave me something from a pest trap (laughs) depends very much what's in it for me to be honest I don't know if this has happened to anyone else but sometimes people are more vigilant than than you think so somewhere I worked for a while I would have members of front of house come and bring me all sorts of things that they find. Like they would go and catch things for me that they saw flying around. And they would then bring me that like some sort of trophy, a bit like a, a bit like a cat brings you like a little (laughs) treat every now and then. (laughs) Bless those people. They were amazing. But like also sometimes, like sometimes it was like things that I would be genuinely concerned about, like clothes moth or something like that. But sometimes it was just like, I found another ladybird. I was like, oh, I I don't care. (laughs) Yeah, we get quite a lot of those flies people are quite keen to show me flies like yeah it's a fly <laughs> but i like that people have enough like you know they're concerned enough we must have tri- we must have taught them something good because you know absolutely they're concerned about insects that's great like that's fantastic i'd rather have that over complete like i 
don't care. So, I mean, that, that, that awareness it must be a bonus. Definitely. I quite agree. And we need more of it. Yes. Um, how about you, Chloe? And what sort of like dealings have you had with IPM and something similar? Um, so I was I did the same training um, at Cardiff University, as, as I think everyone on the call did. But I was I've mainly been responsible for it in two institutions. One was a massive site at an industrial history museum, so multiple buildings all on one site, and it took like two and a half days to do all of it. And some of the some of the the rooms were kind of basement type rooms so obviously this was a you know you know where you're going to find horrors essentially <laughs> but now my current place is a fairly small museum and yeah it doesn't it takes a day half a day to to go around and I don't really find much in the way of anything thankfully touch wood touching wood right now because I don't want that to change very much <laughs> don't want that to change yeah um, so I tend to, I do check every three months, as I think is the kind of recognised regular way to do it as a compromise to monthly. You say that, but but do you remember that really contentious comment that we had on? Yeah, no, that's exactly what I'm thinking about. I think maybe we'll talk about that a bit later, because that's really interesting. People get fighty about how often you should check your pest traps. That's definitely a thing. They really do. Yeah. And I, you know, there's, it, it can create quite a lot of guilt. So um, I think it's it's a nice thing to say maybe that for probably the past maybe six times, so for the last couple of years, it's always been, I've always had an opportunity to have, say, a, a volunteer with me or a student with me to teach IPM to. Oh, that's so good. I feel like it's been quite a long time since I actually just buckled down, went around with my, with my spreadsheet and my pen and my maps and like, all right, tick, 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 tick. Because it's often been like a learning experience for someone. So that's been quite nice. Mm. But yeah, I'm responsible for that. And I use the, um, the spreadsheet format that I think have a feeling is that national trust designed english heritage english heritage right sorry and i use the the english heritage um identification sheet as well because however many times in my life i do this i don't think i'll ever remember <laughs> each insect from appearance all the time yeah so that's me how about you beautiful i feel like i i must horrify you on the basis that i just go around with a with a clipboard and a blank piece of paper and i just write down what i find uh <laughs> I, I don't have... I would just get really confused with that. Oh, well, that, that's fair enough because I, I've got... I'd forget what things were. In general, I kind of do, like, each pest trap has, like, a room number kind of designation. So I can just mm -hmm. write down, like, in FO, in ah. FO2, I found these things. So it's really easy for me to track where, where they are from that point of view. But that's only because we have a convenient building plan where these things are kind of labelled nicely. So, like, that kind of mm. works for me. And I, I don't know if this is, like sad or really really a superpower <laughs> but at this point now i'm just like i can identify most things just by sight like i don't need a microscope or anything what? i'm just like this is amazing i know exactly what this bastard is uh <laughs> <laughs> No, but but sometimes I will just I will have to take the trap with me and do like a double check because sometimes you know it's. A bit mm. like, I'm not really sure about that one. Like, oh, that's a lot of dust on this one. Let's excavate this under a microscope in a little bit. But yeah, I I just go around with like a sheet of paper and a pencil, and then my like fetching trash bag of this is where the gross ones go, and my fre my my nice fresh ones. I always feel like I need to design like a tote bag where I can carry all of this stuff around so that I look less gross going around the galleries. <laughs> Because it will inevitably happen whilst we open because we don't have closed days. <laughs> this always happens when there are loads of people in the galleries and everyone's staring at you and like, hi, yeah, I, you're not allowed to touch this. I'm allowed to touch this. Please don't ever touch these. Thanks, guys. Uh, yeah, look, look, yeah, there's loads of spiders in this one. Yeah, I know. I know. It's great. I know. Oh, there's so many spiders. I know. I know. Go away. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's kind of my routine, <laughs> just in a nutshell. But yeah, so sometimes I will have someone with me, I like an apprentice or a volunteer or another, another member of the collections team, that sort of thing. And on rare occasion, I have to send people out uh, on their own, uh, which I think I had to do last time, actually. For some reason, I couldn't be in the building. Maybe I was off sick or something. But uh, I definitely had to send people around and just be like, please do this. There are ID guides here and there are fresh traps here. And this is what you do. Please do this. And they were absolute stars and did that. Thank you so much, guys. And again, yeah, I use the um, trusted poster that we all have. I love that poster. It's so important to me. I know. That poster is amazing. I think that's like everyone's most trusted friend is that poster. Um, also, I found that someone in the past had done like a really fetching little uh, swatch book of like 
really big pictures of these different beasties that are most commonly found put them on like a little key ring thing so you could just kind of ha- have it in your pocket oh that's cool and i'm like i don't know who made that but thank you that's very cool i usually send that out with like, with people if they have to do it without me so that's also also super duper helpful but yeah so um like you i check them about every three months and uh, it all goes into my magnificent spreadsheet Uh, And then uh, a very, very dull report at the end. (laughs) So I'll say now I don't I don't know what we do with the information other than to basically be able to look month on month. Oh, we've got silverfish again kind of thing. Or, oh, yeah, we need to, you know, buy more of those kind of traps. Oh, but that means that you're tracking the trends. That's that's the whole point. Isn't it's it? tracking the trend, but it's not like we don't write a report up. Um, if there was a problem, the process would change. But the building that we're in is only 10 years old. So at the moment, we're seeing, oh, it's increasing a little, you know, we're noticing a, an increase from the sort of say three years ago yeah, sure. or five years ago, because the building is that is you know, twice as old now. But at the moment, we don't do anything particularly scientific or fancy with our data. We just have it. I don't know that anything I do is particularly fancy. I think it's just, I kind of want people to take pests seriously, so I do a report. <laughs> and yes. I, I don't know if I do that for me. <laughs> Maybe that's just me. But I think it's because uh, previously we haven't we didn't have a collections manager for quite some time. So I kind of needed to right. communicate this with people who didn't speak pest, if you see what I mean. The kind of short, short format report we're talking like eight page um was just kind of a useful way of kind of conveying that actually we need more housekeeping in these areas and this is what we're worrying about and this is the reason why we have loads of silverfish in that particular area it's because there's damp in the cellar you know like just like little basic Mm -hmm. things like that just to be like updating people on the kind of state of play i guess because when i came in i kind of inherited a i don't know this must happen to conservatives all the time but you kind of inherit a weird mishmash of procedures that were never properly written down or anything so i came in and there was kind of pest traps everywhere and i really mean everywhere and they hadn't (laughs) been checked in five million years except for some that had been checked diligently for no discernible reason and no one could tell me like why or who set these rules into place or anything like that and there must be like a million of you like just nodding your heads right now like yeah that definitely happens because it, it was messy and there was nothing written down and there was no clear rules about how often you check anything or where there should be pest traps and all that. So it was like one of my first things to kind of go through, hoover up all of the old pest traps, which I still find. It's four years later. Um, and uh, and just go, okay, these are the sensible locations to have pest traps in unless we notice a problem. So it, it was kind of messy to come into. So I think I just wanted to start kind of telling management, this is why Idea. we're doing this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's I use it as a communication tool, but I probably don't use it to its best. So I'm curious to hear what other people do, really. Well, that that's interesting. I we've gone through phases in in Birmingham of occasionally having reports, which we do for a while, and then not having reports. One of the most useful things I've found to do for me to do with insect data is to do a kind of year on year bar chart. Mm-hmm. so that you can see where the numbers are going up or going down now that works for us because we don't actually have very many insects ironically for someone who is slightly obsessed with <laughs> insect pests, <laughs> we get very few so that that was quite an interesting fairly easy visual thing to do and if you're using the english heritage spreadsheet it's already giving you the the quarterly totals at the top of the spreadsheet mm, we had I love a, that it's brilliant isn't it we had an intern who was much better at excel than me some years ago and she managed to do some whizzy thing where we have a on one worksheet we have a tab for each quarter and then she made another tab and all of those come together and kind of graph the totals so we get an instant yearly picture for each site oh that sounds beautiful it's absolutely all I can do <laughs> for each year is take that spreadsheet, copy it with the next year on, and then take all the data out because I have no idea how she did it. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly but what I do with my brilliant. spreadsheet. <laughs> However, what I have then done is taken those annual totals and built them into a second spreadsheet that will give me a bar chart, mm. which just then says, and these were the numbers sort of six years ago five years ago four years ago so you can then see our numbers fairly constant are they going up and down and that works quite well 
where we have had um, an issue, so we we have had an infestation of golden spider beetles in our uh, 17th century house. They're causing no damage, as far as I can tell. I, I, I've decided to leave them alone, but largely. Um, but that was quite useful to actually do the technique where you have your floor plan with your trap positions marked on, yeah. and then you can start to to record the sort of numbers and and what you're getting of that particular insect on the trap locations. And then you can see how they spread Mm. and if they're going upwards and just, or just across on the floor or whatever. So that's quite useful. But I think as ever with all data, it's really important to spend a little bit of time thinking about who do I want to share this information with Mm -hmm. and what do they need to know and what is the outcome that I want? Yeah. So I think, you know, Jenny, you were saying that you were really just wanting to communicate, you know, here are pests, they're potentially a problem. If you're wanting to change behaviour, then it's really key to show, you know, where insects are, the numbers that go up, where there's been a problem, either because quarantine has been bad. One of one of my colleagues um, who I, at a museum in Scotland, and they probably ought to remain nameless to protect the innocent, highlighted <laughs> that every single moth infestation they ever had came from a curator's office oh god because they're oh wow they're all carpeted with wool carpet they're all of course they are. so oh. there's stacks of paper everywhere so the cleaners open the door go no and come out again oh, <laughs> <to Scotland. laughs> it, it's cold so they all keep jumpers in their desk which of course they never take oh, home so no. the moths say thanks very much and have a wonderful time so that's a good way of showing you know look there weren't any when we were first picking them on traps they were outside your office and then they've moved further into the museum and they've now caused us a problem. So yeah. that's, you know, that's a really good way of, of doing it. Christian Bars at National Museum of Wales has developed a, a, an astounding, but for my tiny brain, very complicated system of really looking at um, insect data and it's based on trap density so christian is absolutely adamant that you have to have and christian will undoubtedly call into the c word if he's listening and i've got this wrong and if i have i apologize christian if i have listened to your papers um but it's it's about you know sort of numbers of traps per meter squared so you're kind of recording like with like oh i see rather okay. than going well in this room i found this many things and in this room i found that many things without oh that's that, very you know, interesting that, that room was tiny this room was huge that's got all the vulnerable stuff in that that hasn't and then um christian's looked at various ways of presenting that and he does interesting things with with kind of i forget the, the, the fancy name for it but it's circles which are you know the bigger the circle the, the bigger the, Ooh, the yeah. issue mm. which mm-hmm. quite yeah. and they you know they look very beautiful but to get to that point feels way beyond my mathematical ability christian's much better at that kind of thing than i am but again that's a really a good way of being a visual communication tool to really try and emphasize that that there are problems and there may be problems in areas that people think you know shouldn't be a concern so it it might be something in in what appears to be a a storeroom of shop stock for instance which nobody's particularly concerned about but actually Mm. we all know that could be one of the big reserves of of problems that then go out into the collection yeah it's interesting isn't it because uh you know, museums, we've talked about this in the food episode, uh, is that museums often have to have food venues in them in some shape, way or form, or indeed events in mm. them. Uh, and this can be um, a cause for friction and concern. Like, that's fine. But, you know, sometimes just please clean up after yourselves. Also, I'm very entertained by this. Um, I mean, first of all, that sounds like Christian's doing magical wizardry things. Oh, it, it, astounding. <laughs> I urge you to go and see Katie's papers. They are uh, wonderful Things. Excellent. I mean, um, we'll try to put some links into that if we can. And basically, I feel like loads of people have been telling me that they are doing like these beautiful visual things, like with um, precisely as you say, like circles that you know are bigger if there's a bigger population found in that kind of area and stuff like that. And I've done a terrible kind of off-brand version of that, and that's because I don't have any fancy like software on my computer at all so i went a bit old school with this and i had loads of acetate sheets like the horrible like kind of thick stuff that he used for like presentations at school in the 90s that sort of mm. thing <laughs> i had tons of this stuff like <laughs> lying around so i i overlaid that over like our floor plans and like started like drawing bigger circles in like colored pen like for oh, like fabulous i mean it's very very homemade but it is trying to achieve that kind of look of look this is where there's a problem i don't think anyone's particularly impressed by my attempt at this because it does not look sleek however i am kind of enjoying it 
just from a just from a personal point of view i'm quite enjoying it um but it's not very scientific because i'm just doing that with a pen (laughs) there's nothing wrong with going old school i think if it it works (laughs) stick with it (laughs) thank you because it's all i've got i think i'm pretty lucky i'm thinking about the ipm experiences i've had in the past and i don't think i've ever been in a situation where i've found a really dreadful kind of concentration of pests or either a surprise uh, increase in the number of a particular type of pest or like changing or spreading pest infestation. Everything that I found has been like, we know there's moth in this room or we know that there's silverfish here kind of thing. Mm. And then you've been very lucky. Well done. So people who our frequent listeners to the show know that I usually do like a strange mind map that Chloe sometimes brings up about what we should talk about in the episode. I love you. I miss your mind map. One of the uh, like branches of the IPM episode one is, oh God, there are effing bugs everywhere, which I think <laughs> brings us into the next bit of the show, which is horror stories. I, I'll, I'll just share some of my traumatic events. Okay. Like this is therapy now. Yeah. Everyone buckle up. <laughs> okay. I'm ready. Previously, I think I've been pretty okay. Like I've been pretty lucky for like a, a quite a long time. And then suddenly I feel like climate change just conspired against me and everything just went. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Within like the same kind of time frame. So it was like 18 months. There were just two horrendous infestations in completely different locations and of completely different things. Now, these things happen, of course, but I think I was slightly traumatised by the entire ordeal, which is why I'm now like, oh God, insects, oh God. So I've gone slightly off the deep end here. The first thing I found was we have a less than ideal storage location where that wasn't checked very often because it's very remote. And essentially, it's a very poorly lit area. And I was just wandering around and looking down on the floor and... The image that sticks in my mind is that I thought, why is there rice on the floor? Oh, no. Why is the rice moving? Oh, no. And it was moths. Uh, It was moth lava. Oh, no. And at that point, we just kind of had to, like, realize that, oh, we're going to have to deal with this whole, uh, the whole store, just the whole store. Get stuff out and quarantine and freeze and all that stuff. And it was not a lovely time. I have to say, something that grosses me out beyond belief is clothes moth. And I don't know why. Like, out of all the things that we that we encounter as conservatives, I don't know why I'm most <laughs> grossed out by that. Like, isn't that weird? Like, I feel like it's a weird phobia of mine, clothes moth. Ugh. And another time, it's just, it was just carpet beetle Armageddon, where it was just suddenly there were carpet beetle everywhere. Oh, no. It was one of those peaks that I can't even explain. I think it was like a cold snap and it drove them inside or something. And I just don't know, because suddenly it went from completely no problems whatsoever, no hotspots, no problem, to holy <laughs> they're everywhere. <laughs> was, again, like a slightly traumatic time, uh, which is when everyone was an absolute superstar, because we had to like deep clean everything and like really deal with stuff. And I have never been so proud of my team because everyone, regardless if they were front of house or collections team or cafe staff or anything, everyone came out and deep cleaned our galleries and our stores and was just super duper. And thank you so much, guys, because you were absolute superstars and you stopped me from crying. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I've had a couple of traumatic times, and yeah, that was when I had to call and call on Bob because I was just like, "What the hell do I do now?" So yeah, sometimes conservation problem solving icky, but yeah, those are kind of that's kind of the level of trauma. Not more than that, but that's about it. <laughs> Again, I think we've been fairly fortunate in our traumatic events. We we did have a a fairly major um, moth outbreak at another one of our properties but this was really kind of early days before well I think we just about started doing an IPM program no one really did it before 2000 which is when we had our first preventive conservator and that there'd been a changeover of staff so it slipped a bit and that the trauma there was in the end we decided that we needed to have a complete floor spray because uh when the house was being converted into a museum which happened in the mid 90s someone made the decision that we would have remake the historic carpets so the the display rooms all had nice wool carpet and of course because they were object spaces no one was vacuuming the carpets oh, yeah. because the cleaners didn't oh. didn't go into those and the house staff 
reckon they didn't have enough time. So, mm. And in the end, we had all of the display rooms with carpet sprayed um, by an external contractor, which necessitated emptying each room in sequence. And we wow. did this twice. Oh my God. And there were, I think, five of us. Having to go through and not only empty the furniture out, but put it all back, Oof. that was probably the most exhausting IPM day I've had. Uh, we also then had another moth infestation. Bizarrely, after we'd moved things from our terrible store, we did find we had a pretty major moth infestation in our cars and our motorbikes, Ooh. which were you know, sort of gently lifting up the leather from a motorbike seat to find and that it is just a mass of oh. webbing and oh. larvae. Oh. And I have to say, I think you are entirely allowed to have the bleh factor. <laughs> and I think it's just something to do with the fact that clothes moth larvae are the most like caterpillars of any, and they just wriggle in a room. They do, they really do. They well. move about like nothing else. It's very grim. Uh, uh, and undoubtedly cockroaches, which I know don't exactly count because they're not an insect pest, but they. Um, no, yeah, yeah there's, there's... I feel like I feel like I can I can I can get the vibe of. Uh. Was it when I was in Lisbon or when I was in? Yes, I'm sure it was when I was in Lisbon. Um, one of the museums there had a, a issue with cockroaches living in the roof, and on one level they're quite pretty because they were not any of the species that we get here they're, they're sort of silvery and quite roundish a bit mm. a bit like huge coins um but they they did occasionally just have phases where they would just drop down from the ceiling in, in oh, no. quantities and get stuck on best traps <laughs> and they were just horrible oh dear me that's not good <laughs> as part of this episode we actually asked people to send us in some of their ipm stories and what they do in their respective institutions, wherever they are in the world. And we've had some fabulous contributions from people. Thank you so much. And I think we should listen to them now. My name is Adrian Doyle. I am the IPM manager for the British Museum. I work in the facilities management department. We are based at the British Museum, which is in central London, England. Hello there. My name is Fabiana Portoni. I am a preventive conservator and I also work for the British Museum. As Adi mentioned, we are based in central London, but we also have an off-site store in East London and an off-site store in West London. IPM is a responsibility which is shared across the whole of the museum, including people that are responsible for monitoring IPM in stores and galleries people who actually undertake IPM treatments, which may be freezing treatments, quarantine, conservation treatments, or in some cases using reduced oxygen. We've also got people who are responsible for making sure that places are clear and clean and are responsible for making sure that objects are regularly assessed to make sure they do not have pest infestations. So how often do we check our insect monitors at the museum? For most areas, we check them every three months. Um, but we do have some cases when we check them at different frequencies. For example, if there's high-risk collections or if it's part of a loan agreement. Question four. What is the strangest thing you found in a trap? Unfortunately, we found mice that have been stuck to traps. Uh, one time I found someone's ring We've also found food, um, obviously the usual things that you find, like pencils and pens. The weirdest thing I found in, in an insect monitor uh, was an insect. It was a carpet beetle, an anthrinus larva, eating another fellow insect that was also stuck in the trap. So it was quite surreal, having a one last tasty meal. Question five. How do you ID what you find? We have four or sometimes even five different IPM training courses which we run through the entire year, which includes courses specifically designed to help people identify insects that they have found on the monitors. We have about seven or eight different types of insect that we find regularly on the monitors. Sometimes they are variations on moths and Obviously, we have a lot of beetles that we find on the floor monitors. We have posters that we can refer to, and we also have what you might call a dead zoo, where we have boxes of dead insects, which are all mounted with correct labels, so we can help identify and cross-reference them. 
Something else we find quite useful to identify insects is using web-based tools, such as what's hitting your collections, but also contacting colleagues in other institutions, colleagues in other museums. They might have a population of an insect that we don't get so often, so they're more familiar with it. And then we can kind of share this, this knowledge. And sometimes when we find insects that are very unusual, we do contact entomologists as well. Hello, CE World Podcast. This is Erica D'Alessandro, Book and Paper Conservator at the Churchill Archive Centre in Cambridge. Regarding our IPM, we check our traps every three months and it's our cleaning lady actually who takes care of that task. Uh, we train her and uh, she's really, really interested in conservation and uh, she loves to do it. So uh, she's checking our traps every three months and every time she has a question or is not sure about something, she comes to us and we look at it together. Uh, so yeah, and one of the weirdest things she found uh, it's not very weird but it's like a huge huge uh, spider so I guess that's quite common actually but it's always quite horrifying when you see it so that's it for me and thank you for your podcast hello I'm Amy Crossman and I'm an independent conservation consultant currently based in Cardiff I'm a conservation expert for the International Museum Academy the Myanmar program we have a team of professionals who are responsible for coordinating and developing IPM in these museums. Currently, the IPM programme is in its early stages, and trapping and monitoring will form the basis of its development. We check our traps bi-monthly and have found some exciting insect pest species. The most unusual pests found are the long-necked ground beetle, Coleurus, the Indian bookworm beetle, Gastralis indicus, and the shiny beetle, Gibium. We are still learning about the damage they cause to the collections and have a network of specialist entomologists based in the UK and Myanmar carrying out identification. One of the benefits of freelancing is seeing how large and small organisations manage their pest monitoring. My very first experience of IPM was at a large organisation. Pest monitoring with blunder traps was run alongside the commercial pest management, which picked up things like mice, rats, etc., at the end of one of our six monthly trap collections, one of the blunder traps held a still wriggling woolly bear. We thought it was cruel to let it continue to struggle in the trap, but no one wanted to do the dread thing until Hannah took the trap in her hand, squeezed, and a squeal went round the group. What do other conservators do when they find live insects in their traps? One place I worked is located in central London. The very nature of the store location, surrounded by cafes, restaurants and rubbish bins, meant it was inevitable that there was an active population of cockroaches. Some of the cockroaches were so big that they couldn't physically fit into the blunder traps and would just push them along the wall. I ended up being the person who collected and disposed of the dead cockroaches, not because I liked it, but because I was the person least afraid, with three layers of gloves on. They were really big, at least four centimetres long. Unfortunately, the organisation decided to allow visitors to eat in the space, and surprise, surprise, those cockroaches grew even larger. Another place I worked, I picked up monitoring from an existing programme. On my first round of trap checking, we found a number of large brown spiders in a particular area. We all know spiders themselves aren't destructive, but can be food sources for other pests. And besides, I wanted to know how the spiders got into the otherwise clean, low-use space. It turns out six months previous, the facilities person had decided to store an overflow supply of paper towels in the record storage space because they didn't think it would do any harm. The towels had been moved into the space directly from the loading bay with no quarantine time. So the lesson is, don't let your facilities people store their supplies in with the records. Hi, my name is Lucy and at the time of my tale I was a trainee at a private book and paper conservation studio in Cornwall, United Kingdom. As part of a small team of three trainees, we took turns to inspect pest traps every month, a system put in place by previous trainees. We had a map of the studio and the locations of the traps in places around the studio, including on the windowsills, near to where we store our objects and even the toilet. It was a great way to put IPM on our CVs, even at such a small scale. 
We use the well-known English Heritage poster to identify our pests as well as online resources, but most of the time non-pests wandered onto our blunder traps, including spiders, woodlice and tiny flies. One summer's day, my fellow trainee Holly found a snake in the pest trap in the bathroom. After scooping it up, we discovered it was in fact a legless lizard, as known as a slow worm. It was very much still alive, likely attracted by all the spiders and woodlice on the trap. We still have no idea how it got into the bathroom. We did a quick search online and discovered that slow worms are protected by law in the UK, so it was very important to free it. We found out that cooking oil could be used to lubricate and free stuck animals on blunder traps. I used some olive oil and my micro spatula to gently ease them away from the sticky surface. I made sure to wipe away any glue and oil residues from him and set him free into the lovely summer sun. Thank you so much, C-Word, for a wonderful podcast, and I look forward to more episodes in the future. Hi, my name is Emily Brown. I'm conservator of sculpture and decorative arts at the Ringling Museum of Art in Sarasota, Florida. I grew up and worked my whole life in the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania area. Uh, So up until this point, I was very familiar with pests common in more temperate climates. Uh, But when I started this job in December of 2019, I very quickly learned about several new-to-me museum pests. One is the drywood termite, which is a species of termite found in tropical areas and one that that is very common here in Florida. About three weeks into my new position, an infestation was discovered in an object on display which instigated a three-day examination and deep clean of a museum gallery. Drywood termites are sneaky buggers. Their colonies take about five years to mature, then fertile adults can leave the colony by means of swarming and go reproduce and start a new colony elsewhere. They're extremely difficult to detect and really only could be once the colony has matured enough and you start to see these neat little piles of frass underneath the exit holes of their tunnels and possibly shed wings from swarming adults. During the examination and deep clean project, I also discovered a couple more museum pests that aren't necessarily harmful to collections. They don't eat the artwork, only other insects. Both are small lizards, Uh, little anoles and geckos. Anoles depend on water and moisture to stay alive, so unfortunately when they enter the building, they die of dehydration pretty quickly. I found several desiccated anole carcasses underneath cases in the gallery. Geckos, however, can survive without constant moisture for quite some time, and to quote a colleague and native Floridian, they like to hide behind the paintings and come out at night. Uh, presumably to eat other pests. To this point, I found a shed gecko skin loosely stuck to the wall behind a painting we had just deinstalled. Both anoles and geckos poop, obviously, and during this time, I also became acquainted with identifying their poop. So while anoles and geckos don't eat the artwork per se, they do poop on it, and when they die, are food for other less benign museum pests. Well, I hope you like this little story of a few pests found here in Florida that you might not have heard of or thought of being in museums before. I was teaching on the book and paper program at Camberwell College and uh, we were going to be doing some pest identification the following week. I put some pest traps around the studio and just outside in the corridor. The following week, went to collect them, see what we had. They'd all been removed by the cleaners. We ended up hunting through the storeroom and found a, a long forgotten pest trap that had been there several years, covered in dust. Inside was just a, a very desiccated spider and something that may have been a cockroach nymph, but was really uh, difficult to identify. We took it back to the studio, tried to dissect what was in there, but um, it was, was not the most illuminating session we could have had.
Um, I absolutely love the idea of a dead zoo. Oh, I know. Right? Um, <laughs> oh, I know we talked about identification a little bit earlier in the episode, and I've definitely seen people under microscopes really getting like the the exact uh, exact species and exact like you know can can you identify the sex of them? Can you identify age? That sort of thing. Um, and I really like the idea of having a reference collection. And I was really interested that talking to entomologists was something that kept coming up, which is really cool. Oh, yeah. Right. So I, I, I must say I've only had that in one place. So um, so when I did my internship whilst we were at Cardiff, I, I went to do do mine at a local authority museum. But they just happened to still have a natural history expert or like a natural science expert. And uh, he was indeed a bug expert. And that meant that you could... You, cool. Yeah, you could go to him if you really couldn't identify something, which was kind of amazing. What a resource to have. I mean, I doubt most places have that anymore. But Oh, and just to say, as, as an alternative to having a dead zoo, of course, as the online version, uh, which uh, a certain Jane might actually have some comments on. <laughs> I might do. I, I may just have to comment that I, I do love AD he has fantastic turns of phrases in relation to IPM. One of my other favourites of his, which didn't make it into his slot, was he likes to talk about things having a munchability index. Oh, I'm going to have to start using that. That has a perfect co- combination of whimsy and um, <laughs> <laughs> slight gross out. It's it's great, isn't it? And uh, I, I, I felt for the one contributor who was talking about the fact that um, they've got a live woolly bear on a trap and nobody would kill it. Oh, yeah. And I really liked that, 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 you know, that they then asked what other people do. And I'm, I'm a squisher. I'm definitely a squisher. If something is alive on a trap, I'm not beyond squishing it. No, I'll, I'll, I'll generally squish it. Occasionally, we've, we've caught things which are not on traps. And so I leave them in a box to run about for a bit so I can kind of see what they do. <laughs> I laugh, but I totally put them in a jar and have a look at them. <laughs> Absolutely. I can tell you it takes live clothes for five days to die when they're sitting on a trap if you don't squash them. Which is wow. Oh, wow. That's wonderfully grim. Like kind <laughs> of uh, medieval torture, but for conservatives. <laughs> yeah, oh dear. The only thing alive that I found was a f- giant spider. Oh, yeah. And this is my, I can't deal with spiders at all. Oh, and yes, I kept you- a bit quiet was it was when it we were talking about spiders. Um, horror trap horror stories because mine are pathetic they're just there's a spider can't do it nope nope and i have definitely have several really spider like arachnophobic members of staff and they are not happy not all right i'm not okay i listen and um with great kind of respect and sympathy to the the freeing of the um freeing of the slow worm that was oh, really cool yeah. that was, um and that i have lovely. i have had to in fact i sent an all staff email out once saying there is a spider on a trap i can't deal with it can someone come and free it it's alive come now <laughs> like come, come now and then someone did it and i don't know how they did it because the little legs the spiders are also tremendously strong so sometimes you would just find that oh, if one's Jesus trapped don't. with just two legs or something they will oh. drag that pest trap miles it's pretty impressive oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not to make it grim or anything, but <laughs> it's not all. It's not all right. Uh, so several of my colleagues are real spider phobes, and yet they will still go and check pest traps for me, and I'm full Aww. of admiration for them. You know that you, you get proper girly screams and everything. It's brilliant. <laughs> but they still do it. <laughs> um, I would like to take just a moment um, of advice for anyone who is a. Um, genuine panic stricken arachnophobe like i am litter pickers i use litter pickers so i can pick up the trap place it on a table away from my face and then slowly peer into the trap so that if there is a horrible horrendous monster in the trap you've got a little bit there's no shock factor you're in control that's my advice get yourself some litter pickers all right then um Oh, also a shout out to the the people who had a cleaning lady who was really in, into collecting the pest traps and identifying the pests. Oh, I wish I could have one. <laughs> I know she sounded amazing. I know. I, I, I want her. <laughs> I'm pretty grateful that we don't have termites. I have to say. Yeah, definitely. And in also, this country. and also kind of grateful that I don't have to deal with like gecko poop. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> Uh, also i really enjoying that you know finding all the normal stuff like pens and pencils is that normal <laughs> uh, i just enjoyed that casual anecdote of we always find those do we okay i find mine missing more than anything else <laughs> yes if anything it's that although that does 
bring a question to mind. What is the strangest thing that you've found in a pest trap? I think we're a bit prosaic in Birmingham because it's not really weird, although um, it's interesting considering we're suburban Birmingham. We found a shrew. What? <laughs> wow. Was it alive? Uh, thankfully, no. Oh, Otherwise, yeah. that would have been even more horrible. But, yeah. um, you know, mice we do get periodically, but shrews? Oh, yeah. Uh, That's really, really specific. Yeah. It is. I was really impressed that we had shrews. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. That is pretty impressive, actually. In terms of weirdest thing that I've found, I think uh, the most endearing thing that I've found is that one place that I used to work, uh, someone used to put glitter stickers of insects inside the pest traps. <laughs> what? <laughs> Oh, well, so literally just leaving me an Easter egg. I mean, that's very specific. <laughs> what? Yeah, I mean, amazing stuff. Real commitment <laughs> is a bit. It's amazing. <laughs> that that remains my favourite pest trap find. Definitely. Perfect. That just sounds lovely. It was. It really cheered me up. <laughs> Something that occurred to me when I was listening to the contributions um, from the BM is they were talking a lot about the other aspects of, of integrated pest management that wasn't just bug traps. So of the... Th- things that we've discussed and the experiences that we've had what do we do with pests and infested objects other than throw them away if, there's, <laughs> if it's a lost cause I, I try not to. Um, and how do we yeah exactly uh, and how do we prevent it from all going wrong so if they're if things are big and or like small enough i should say to fit in a freezer then i try to freeze things because it's quite it's quite mm-hmm. relatively gentle you're not introducing anything blah blah that sort of thing and it's quite easy to have access to a freezer as well isn't it because they're not hugely expensive i mean you say that i mean deep freezers will get you far i'm not gonna lie because we've got two deep freezers and i'm so grateful however if it's bigger than what fits in a deep freezer that's when it get can get tricky yes there are places dotted around that do have like walk-in freezers that you can that you can mm-hmm. use and you can hire freezers if you've got the funds uh like freezer trucks that sort of thing but again there's like mm-hmm. security and funding and sometimes that can really be the kind of limiting factor but i'm a big fan of freezing things like i love that i do know that people use heat sometimes and I'm going to confess that I've I... I've heard of that, but I have no idea what it's about. I'm going to confess that I don't really know much about that, which I feel bad about. But Shall I enlighten you in that case? Yeah. Oh, please. Yeah. So, um, 52 centigrade for an hour will kill all stages of insects. Mm-hmm. And it used to be very common that, that people with entomology collections would put their drawers into ovens oh. at 52. And it killed everything. It it did have an unfortunate tendency of warping the drawer so it wouldn't go back in the cabinet. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. a problem, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You only absolutely. made that mistake a couple of times, don't you? you do. <laughs> so what is more commonly done now, although there are some really amazing um, hotbox type treatments, which Tom Strang at the Canadian Conservation Institute has written about, where mm. you can wrap things in black bin bags essentially and put them on roofs if you get hot enough and oh, and that will Amazing. that will work and it's really incredible particularly for parts of the world where they don't have yeah. you know, very reliable electricity or, yeah. or anything so um uh, that's that's worth looking out for but the uh more sophisticated way of using heat treatment is also then to introduce humidity and this has really been brought to a peak i suppose by thermolignum and in the uk mm. they are now no longer part of thermolignum they're part of i park but they're still based down in london and it's a 24-hour cycle so things go into the chamber it's it's great because you don't have to wrap anything it gradually heats it up and it also introduces moisture and then it holds it at 52 for an hour and then it cools down and, and also then dehumidifies so that the idea is it comes back to ambient things haven't warped or moved it can have some exciting unintended side effects so people have found that old furniture that goes in the heating and humidifier tends to soften the animal glue in the joints oh, so furniture com- comes out tighter and you know more robust than it went in <laughs> oh my god <laughs> and then also heal the object <laughs> absolutely and if it's had a, a previous um, fumigation treatment with some of the rather noxious chemicals that comes off in the treatment so it's then safe to, to handle which is wow. amazing we've never used it unfortunately partly because you have to get you either have to set individual objects to london yeah. and, and mm. make the doesn't meet the emissions regulations 
<laughs> or yeah. you get the mobile chamber to come to you. But I know colleagues in Wakefield did that with a whole store mm. and they were able to treat an entire store in a week. That's insane. I love very, it. Very, very impressive. Yeah. And let's see, after that, I think we're down to pesticides pretty much if if you want to go down that route because there are certain pesticides that, you know, are considered kind of museum safe. Yeah, so I think isn't... I mean, would you say it's accurate, Jane, to, to say that our measures using an integrated system are to try and avoid as much as possible the use of pesticides? Yes, pretty much. Mm. Partly because... I have um, a cat visitor, I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> very good reason to avoid using pesticides because they're not good for our pets particularly cats unfortunately mm. um, oh no yeah don't don't use constrain near a cat Shh. keep keep them out of the area for 24 hours because it does not do them any good at all yeah so a, a lot of the materials that we used to use we found either were ozone depleters Mm. or proved to be carcinogenic mm. so a lot of the insecticides are gone and those that are left are now principally based on permethrin-derived materials, which are effective, but they still cost. And obviously the point of cost is to try and remove the risk where you can by using other things. So that's where we get the integrated bit from. So it, mm. it's trying to prevent pests in the first place, yeah. to identify them at an early stage, hence using trapping. And therefore, you've only got a few to deal with rather than an entire store full and then to treat appropriately. So to only deal with the thing that actually has the infestation rather than go, oh, well, we will just fumigate the entire store, which is what used to be done very routinely. Yeah, yeah, quite. Yeah. So it, it does pain me that I have had to use pesticides on rare occasion, but. As far as far as I can, I you know I obviously try not to. It was really one of those last ditch attempts of there are no other workable solutions. I will yeah. resort to it, but I guess that's what it's there for. Like it it can be a plan C. You know you've tried A, yeah. you tried B. Ah, we'll have to go to C. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, so it it is one of those it is one of those judgment calls. But yeah, so constraint is the one that I'm 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 thinking of and it's the only one that I've, I'm familiar with to be honest and uh, I'm sure there are other ones in different parts of the world um, if you've got experiences please do share them I'm always curious to hear about it and yeah so there are ways of dealing with the beasties I'm, I'm also quite a big fan of desiccant dusts I don't know if either of you have used those oh interesting tell me more so desiccant dusts are um, based on silica and they have a physical action so what happens is when the insect crawls through it all our insects have a wax coating on the outside and the sharp particles rip through that wax, which then allows the, the moisture to just leave the insect and they dry out, which is oh, why they're called fascinating. dust. That's really interesting. So they're really, really good for dead spaces, under floors. You know, if you can get them underneath built-in showcases before they close it up completely. And they just sit there and work forever unless you vacuum them up. And they're, they're really... That is fascinating. They're really, really effective. Their big downside is because they're silica-based, is they're unbelievably slippery. So if you get a bit of overspill oh. on the surface, you, you find that you're skating around. Oh. Um, are there any health and safety concerns with breathing them in or anything, like working around them? When you're applying them, again, because they're a silica-based material, they... Mm. Mm. can be very drying to the skin which can be a particular right. problem if you suffer from things like eczema or psoriasis so it is a good idea to wear gloves and if you breathe them in they will act as an irritant so you know, they right. won't actually cause you they won't trigger an illness or anything like that but mm -hmm. they, they can make you cough and if you have asthma or something like that it's not great so it's not a bad idea to wear a mask just to avoid it right yeah that's really cool though i had, I had not heard of those so Maybe we could share some uh, resources that we that we really think people should know about. An obvious one is what's eating your collection. <laughs> um, so do you want to describe what that is then and where it came from? Mm. Yeah, so when David Pinniger and I started doing IPM training courses for the West Midlands, it became very apparent that although there were some good books out there, principally written by Dave, um, it was quite difficult to find a one-stop shop of resources and there were some new insects starting to emerge and people couldn't find images of them. So we wanted to develop a resource 
which would help people with identification, but also how to do IPM and some basic information on things that seem obvious. But if you've never done it, you kind of think, how do I do this? Like putting a trap together. Um, so initially we developed a CD-ROM. Remember those? No. Oh. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Barely. Remember, <laughs> Retro. Remember CD-ROMs? The big problem with the CD-ROM, of course, is once it's out there, you can't update the content. Mm. Mm. So we um, were fortunate to get a bit more Renaissance in the Regions funding and we were able to develop a website and it kept the title that we'd used for the the course they're they're all slightly punning stroke you know meant to be a bit humorous so what's in your collection <laughs> seemed to be a, a good way of easing people in it, it was a bit less scary than things that go munch in the night which is <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. i really hope that's your next project that's brilliant <laughs> So we, it was very much based on the CD-ROM with some more information. So the idea is that the, the website contains information about how to do IPM. It's got the biggest collection of insect photographs. And it's not only the insect, but it's got the larvae, it's got damage, it's got, you can relate them together. So it, if you think it's this, but it doesn't look quite right, it will take you to another thing and say, well, it could be this. And they're oh, all, that's cool. it's nice, isn't it? And they're all accurate. You know, the problem with sometimes when you Google an insect on the internet is, you you know, you just get rubbish because you're reliant mm. on mm. what people put up there. We've also, in more recent years, added a database of IPM resources. So it's articles, books, papers um and that's compiled for us by amy crossman who was one of your contributors yes and then as we went on people started to say things like well is woodworm really common in herefordshire and we had to go i don't know because people don't collect information on what are known as indoor insect pests Mm. because most people are interested who are doing research they're interested in crop pests and that kind of thing oh interesting they don't care much about carpet beetle yeah um we're very we're very niche Uh, (laughs) as usual (laughs) absolutely (laughs) and we were starting to see it was principally almost prompted by the Guernsey carpet beetle which is one of the few insects which actually comes from the place it is named after most oh. mostly they don't you know so the australian carpet beetle is not from australia for instance <laughs> but guernsey carpet beetle is and then it finally looked around and escaped and found the vna in the 90s mm-hmm. and it said i like this thanks very much and it's now the dominant species at the vna because it's oh, slightly wow. bigger than very carpet beetle so it eats more and faster so it outcompetes very carpet beetle mm. um and it's kind of spread in the southeast and there are one or two hot spots further north we think where it's moved on loans but on the whole we think it's moving because of climate change mm, yeah uh, it, it uh. is not in birmingham interesting and, and jenny i would hazard get it's not with you in yorkshire and chloe it's not with you in manchester no, no I, not I don't one. believe so no. no they they're slightly whiter looking than mm. varied carpet beetle and the key thing you need to look for is the shape of the scales so this is where you do actually need a microscope and it's because people were asking these questions and we didn't know that we set up a pest recording database on what's eating your collections. It's entirely voluntary. People can you know, just apply and say, I'd like to give you my data. Yeah. And that's allowed us to plot various things and already start to draw some conclusions. So we can say with the data we have, and I should emphasise, it is very historic house heavy Mm -hmm. because the fabulous deal order who leads on ipm for english heritage dutifully every quarter puts on all of her data for all of their properties oh wow she's just astounding it takes d forever she's absolutely incredible and we also have a lot of data from the national trust so we are very very historic house heavy we haven't got nearly enough museums so if people are in a museum and they would like to contribute there's a little thing that says register in the top right hand corner of the website um, that would be fabulous get on that um but we know for instance that two spot carpet beetle atogenus pelio is a species that is restricted to historic houses it is not found in museums oh that's so interesting oh wow why that should be the case we don't know (laughs) but from the evidence we have that's what we can show so that's 
you know, one of the things we want it to do. So um, advanced news is we're very much hoping with the support of a number of um, organisations who will all be named in big flashing lights on the website. We should be doing an upgrade mm. this this year, which will mean that what's in your collections will work on your smartphone. Um, <gasps> That's exciting. Oh, so that is won't, exciting. You won't need to take the poster with you to do identifications when you're doing your trap check. Ooh. You'll just be able to look at the website. Yes, yes, excellent. <laughs> I'm right now on my list. <laughs> Real. I was just going to say a final thing, if that's okay, yeah. um, just to yeah. encourage people to put their data on. When you then look at it from the front end, it's entirely anonymised. You can only sort of look at it by county list. You can't even look at it by town or city list. And we've fiddled with the map so that you can't zoom in really closely. <laughs> if, if you're the only museum in Blogsville, then it might be kind of <laughs> obvious where you are. But otherwise... <laughs> You know, we'll, you'll be able to work out that it's a museum in Surrey, for instance, but otherwise you, you can't really work out exactly what it mm. is. So, you know, we're, we're not trying to make the people are nervous. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's not about airing dirty washing. It's about sharing information. Yeah, essentially. Oh, so Chloe, cool. if you're wondering what to do with your data, this is the perfect thing to do with it. Stick it what's in your, your collections. Mm. I was going to give a shout out to kind of the American website that's museumpests.net. Yeah. Um, that one's also a useful resource. And I was just going to say that I do believe the Integrated Pest Management Conference of last year that was in Stockholm, I do believe the conference papers are available online now. Yes. Yes. So I shall find a link to that and pop it in the show notes. I, I was sad that I, I missed out on that because I just couldn't oh, go. It was brilliant. Oh, It was brilliant. <laughs> Two and a half days talking about insects. It was utterly <laughs> <laughs> we such nerds. <laughs> how much depth did people go into was it all species related and specific projects and stuff it was quite carefully uh kind of subdivided so there were some very practically focused papers people talking about what they were doing there were some innovative treatments so there was some looking at the use of, of dogs to sniff out oh yeah i heard about that species. oh wow you know, it looks very cute, but I'm I'm not entirely sure it's it's going to. My concern was about having then to deal with dog pee in my historic interiors. But. <laughs> <laughs> there were some things looking at trends and evaluating treatments. There was a really amazing paper from Japan where they did a thermolignum treatment of an entire temple. Oh, oh wow. wow! It was just phenomenal because they were really wanting to move away from using chemicals. Yeah. So this was the first non-chemical treatment they'd done and you know they kind of went big and did a whole temple it was just wow. amazing <clears throat> that's really cool so it's a big it's a big mix of things yeah, yeah that sounds really cool well we'll definitely definitely put a link into those then does anyone else have any favorites they want to share i i do have another one which is just brilliant which is the the latest book from david pinniger which he's co-authored also with d lauder pests in houses great and small oh yes mm which is aimed really at the general reader, but works brilliantly for people who were doing IPM as a job. It's just one of the most entertaining books on IPM I have ever read. I sat and read it from cover to cover on a train. Um, <laughs> it covers all kinds of things. English Heritage have put in a number of their case studies for various things to say, well, we had a problem, but we did this, you know, so it was okay. And it has a beautiful uh, drawing the, the front cover opens out and there's this fabulous cutaway house which shows you all the kind of areas where you could get pest problems and what's led to them and it's a thing of beauty in itself it's just brilliant it's really really good read um lovely and well, i would you know, we'll definitely a put nice a link to that the... as well that sounds amazing and it's available through amazon as well not just through english heritage and in fact i have found it in my local waterstone so oh, fair oh fair. brilliant <laughs> Oh, as a as a last thing, I just want to say that I do enjoy that sometimes the pests in museums and historic properties do actually make like national headlines. I love that when when that happens because then it's just like look yes. look what we do. It's like the 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 new type of silverfish that was like everywhere for a bit, like in terms yep. of the newspaper headlines. It was amazing. Suddenly people were like, ooh silverfish in museums or historic properties. And it was just like yeah, we deal with that all the time. But thanks for noticing. <laughs> It was good, though. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Jane. You've been an absolute treasure to have on. Thank you so much. It, it's been a pleasure. Who could want for anything more than to spend an hour or so talking about bugs, which are just fabulous things. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are very grateful. Thank you so much.
And now we've got an extra from Christina. So stay tuned for a bonus interview that's actually got nothing to do with pests. It's the 24th of April, right in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. And I'm talking to Abigail Bainbridge, who's a freelance book and paper conservator based in London. Uh, Abigail, I asked to do a quick interview with you because I saw something you'd put on Twitter about a project you're involved with to sew scrubs for um, medical staff. Yeah, so it's, um, I think there are a lot of concurrent projects going on right now to sew scrubs for the NHS. But the one I'm involved in was started by a few fashion designers, and they've called it the Emergency Design Network. And it's, um, I believe, about half of our initial batch of 400 scrubs is being sewn by a Welsh family business. Mm -hmm. And then the other 200 are being done by home sewers. Um, And I think primarily they're probably fashion people, but we know one of the designers, Phoebe Inch, and I knew she was doing this and I got in touch to tell her that conservators might be able to help. So I think there are about 15 of us on this initial pilot. Oh, wow. Okay. And if it works out, there are going to be subsequent um, rounds. Why do you think conservators in particular would be a good fit for this kind of undertaking? Yeah, I was explaining that to Phoebe because she wanted to know um, what kind of skills she could expect from us or what we would be good at when we were initially trying to figure out how we could help. Uh, And what I told her is that there might be some of us who already know how to sew clothes, but that in general, if people had access to the right equipment, we're people who know how to figure out how to make new things generally, I think, and have good attention to detail and can understand instructions and all those sorts of things that we have to do in our jobs anyway. And I think they're all transferable skills, the things that we do for objects. And I suppose also the idea that you never really get the same object twice. So (laughs) we're constantly learning new things anyway. And where are you doing the sewing? Do you have a conservation studio at home? I do. I feel really lucky to have a studio at home right now. Um, so I've got a big clean space and because I'm a book conservator, well, that's why it's clean. <laughs> I'm thinking of my husband's <laughs> studio as a furniture conservator, which would not be suited for this. <laughs> <laughs> but I know some people are sewing in their living rooms. Um, one person who's a preventative conservator also has her 16-year-old helping her. So I think it's all a bit Uh, cobbled together depending on what people have access to but we're all just using domestic machines Um, patterns a little bit tricky to make um, the types of seams that hold up to the kind of heavy duty wear and washing that they get but so far it seems to be going well we're supposed to have them done by monday and there's another drop that's happening i think at the end of next week so having the the fabric is being cut by someone and the materials are all being put together. Um, it's everything, including the thread and the size tags. And so then we just follow the pattern and get it together as fast as possible. How's this being funded? Is it being crowdfunded or? Yes, they are fundraising. And I should probably have something to tell you uh, about where people can go. But if you look <laughs> for the Emergency Design Network on Instagram... <laughs> Um, they are very loudly asking for help, um, because I mean, all the labor is donated, including the people who are organizing it. They put in a huge amount of work and of course everyone's sewing and I believe they've gotten the fabric at cost, uh, but there is still the cost of buying the fabric. I think it's Mm -hmm. the primary cost. So basically the more they can raise, the more we can make and that they seem to be quite urgently needed. It doesn't sound like the shortage is going to end anytime soon. Do you know if they're looking for more volunteer people to sew? So um, the other piece of this is we set up the emergency conservators network to kind of parallel the designers just to have a portal for keeping people in the loop. So the we in that is um, Natalie Brown from the National Archives and Catherine Higgett from National Gallery and me, because we realized we were all kind of doing the same thing, trying to help people find out how they can help. So we've set up a uh, Google form where conservators can sign up to help. At the moment, it's just in London because of the yeah restrictions on travel and everything and where the materials are. 
But I think if people want to help, they're more than welcome to get in touch with me and I can try to find out somewhere local to them that they can help. Um, I know there's mask, uh, face shield, sorry, making happening as well around the country. It's just been really nice to be able to help. Like, I'm not sure how much help it really is. It feels like it's a small scale, but I suppose the more everybody does small little bits, the more impact we can have. Mm. It's kind of hard watching the people that are on the front lines need to do so much of such hard work and then just sit home and do nothing. So it feels quite good to be able to do a small thing. And after that call to action, we've got something completely different, a round of conservation cocktails. Today's recipe is appropriately pest-themed. Enjoy. Responsibly, of course. Hello, and welcome to the Benchwork Bar. I'm Amanda Richards, and, I, and today we'll be making a carpet beetle. What you'll need for this is a shaker, a half a cup of ice, two ounces of tequila, six ounces of lemonade, half an ounce of smoked herb simple syrup. The simple syrup is quite easy, um, takes after its name and simple syrup. You'll just need a half a cup of sugar, half a cup of water, and that's going to be the base to any simple syrup you make. Bring that to a boil until everything's dissolved and let it cool. The little twist here is before you bring it to a boil, you're going to throw in the rest of the ingredients as well, which is two sprigs of thyme, half of a bay leaf, up to one bay leaf, one to two leaves of sage, and some lemon zest. Um, if you're feeling really fancy, take a sprig of rosemary and throw that in as well. If you're feeling extra fancy, light that rosemary on fire, let it smoke for a couple seconds, and then toss it in. And that's how you'll get your smoked herb. All right. Now, once it's up to a boil, you'll pull it off the heat and just let it steep for 15 to 20 minutes. Then let it cool and you have your simple syrup ready. Strain it out and you're good to go. You can keep that in your fridge covered uh, and sealed for up to two weeks. All right, so let's get started with the rest of the drink. Very simple here. What you're going to do is grab your shaker. Got mine here. Throw in that half a cup of ice. All right, now toss in your six ounces of lemonade. Now you can use fresh squeezed or... I'm using crystal light because, you know, we're in a pandemic and it's what I've got on hand. All right. Now you're going to throw in two ounces of uh, tequila. Everyone loves tequila, right? All right. I've got my little measuring device here. Throw that thing in. All right. And lastly, you've got your simple syrup. It should be cooled and steeped and strained. And then throw roughly hmm, half an ounce in, a little bit more if you like it a little bit sweeter. All right, now you're gonna put your shaker lid on. I like to wrap mine in a towel because it always leaks. Shake it just for a couple times, three or four times is good. I'm just trying to incorporate it. Grab your glass, open up the shaker all the way, and you're gonna pour the whole thing in. And that is your carpet beetle. Enjoy. And for more of that, go follow Amanda on at Conserve It All on Twitter and keep an eye on the hashtag Conservation Happy Hour. If you're enjoying the C word and would like to support our work, then please consider becoming one of our patrons. For as little as $1 per month, you can help us keep our episodes online and more of them coming. Patreon helps us meet our regular costs for the show, and also to plan ahead so we know roughly how much of a monthly budget we've got. That's super helpful when you're trying to do something special like buy a better microphone or save up to go to a special event. Your support also helps keep us free of advertisements. In return, our supporters get access to our archive of extended episodes, which you can only access on our Patreon page. Yeah, for that $1 a month, you get a little extra audio enjoyment. We crunch the numbers, and it's about 10% extra content on a regular basis. That's not bad for less than a cup of coffee, eh? 
If supporting us sounds like something you'd like to do, then head over to patreon.com slash the C word and join our bunch of absolute champions. Thanks for listening. We're The C Word and you've been listening to Jane Thompson Webb, Chloe Rumsey and me, Jenna Mathiasen. Join us next time for an episode about analysis. In the meantime, check out our website at theseaword.show, tweet us at the C Word Podcast, or simply email us on theseawordpodcast at gmail.com. The intro and outro music is Spring by Dee Music, used under a Creative Commons attribution license. Additional music and sound effects by Callum Robertson. This has been a Wooden Dice production. Mm. That's my thinking noise now. Mm. <laughs>